Chapter 9, How to Become a Super Collector Did you know, FLIR Ultra was initially shown in advertisements as being named FLIR Elite, but had to change the name, presumably because of the Donner sensor set of the same name. I'm going to be upfront with you. Setting your sights on becoming a super collector should probably not be an inspiration in your life. There are far too many other important things to focus on. Super collecting takes up a lot of money, time, and brain power. Did I mention money? Competing with other fellow collectors on rare cards can be very taxing on your psyche and wallet. You may find yourself spending crazy money on numerous cards you don't even care about just because you don't yet have them. Anatomy of a Super Collector Before I go any further, I thought I'd give a shot to describe what a super collector looks like. Generally speaking, a super collector is simply someone who obsessively collects a certain niche, be it a player, team, etc., with laser focus and goes way beyond casual collecting. Super collectors typically share many of these characteristics. There is an extremely clear and apparent intentionality about their collection. Their most vivid dreams are about landing a rare item. Their collection is heads and tails better than most in their collecting niche. Their spouse despises the object they desire, mainly because the super collector typically goes overboard. They have significantly more cards in their collection than cards on their want list, including the incredibly difficult to obtain pieces. They are considered by the vast majority of the collecting community to be a super collector. Their favorite memories in life have to do with capturing a super rare card. They may have a pet or child named after their favorite player. Vacations are planned around new card releases. When anyone asks a super collector what's new in life, their first thought is to respond by sharing what new cards they recently picked up. They have a room that looks like a shrine dedicated to the object of their affection. And finally, last but not least, non-collectors may typically think that super collectors genuinely have a problem that may actually not be far from the truth. To other collectors, a super collector's name is what may first come to mind when they think of the player they collect. For example, when I hear anything about Andre Dawson, I don't just think of his stellar career. I think about Dustin and his amazing Dawson collection, boasting over 150,000 cards of the Hawk alone. Whenever I hear anything about Mark Teixeira, I don't just think about how great of a player he was. I think of Robert and his jaw-dropping collection of over 1,000 one-of-one cards of Tex. Being synonymous with a specific collecting niche is the dream of any super collector. Deciding what to collect. When you set out to focus on collecting a player, team, or other niche, you may not be sure which direction you would like to take or what parameters to set. One of the questions I heard the most was, what made you want to collect Kinseiko? Many may remember him for the ball bouncing off of his head for a home run, his tell-all book, and more recently his eccentric tweets. I remember him as my childhood hero, the 4040 man, and the former best player on the planet. Kinseiko was larger than life, and he transcended the game. In his prime, if you didn't know anything about baseball, you still knew about him. The man even had a 900 number that his fans could call to hear recordings of him. Throughout the years, I've picked up some amazing items of the best players in baseball history, but I never had the desire to keep anything. From a Mickey Mantle autographed baseball to a 2009 Bowman Chrome Mike Trout Blue Refractor autograph, I had no real emotional attachment to anything. Everyone would drool over pieces I had, but they never excited me enough to keep. Conversely, I was never so attached to Kinseiko the man that I wanted to collect everything with his face on it. I didn't go after magazines, posters, figurines, plates, or any of those other similar items. It was at the intersection of baseball cards and Kinseiko that I found a deep love for super collecting. My intense passion simply wouldn't have existed without both. Regardless of the direction you take, be prepared to be called crazy. When you set out to mark the path of your own collecting journey, 
You have to find what you are passionate about. Find out what excites you and not just what interests others. Remember, there's no right or wrong answer in collecting. What you like may not interest others in the least, and that's okay. Collecting for the approval of others will leave you unsatisfied. When you set a path that excites you and stick to a budget for the hobby, you can enjoy collecting without any guilt. I wholeheartedly endorse being a casual collector. There's more than enough cardboard to go around for those who collect casually. For the super collector, there isn't. You don't just want some cards, you want all of them. Nevertheless, I want to document my story. So in spite of my warnings, do as I say, not as I did, here is my story on how I came to be known not only as the number one Kinseiko super collector, but also the poster child for super collecting baseball cards. That's what many others have said at least. I'd never be so bold to give myself that title. How I did it. There is a vibrant and active collecting community online. As a super collector, I had a choice to make. Be passive and merely pick up cards that showed up on eBay, or be proactive and make my name synonymous with collecting Kinseiko. To stay in front of the collecting community's eyes, I would frequently publish articles talking about hobby history and post prank stories. I would also display my latest pickups, write about my latest inventory acquisitions, post card collecting memes and GIFs, and feature my custom work. My activities were an outpour of the passion I have for the hobby. I love cards, the collecting community, and almost everything in between. As a byproduct of my efforts, I became known as the go-to guy when someone had a rare Conseco card for sale. This wasn't all I did though. I proactively used a number of methods to get the best Conseco cards into my collection. Here are some tools I used that helped me and can hopefully help you too. Tool number one, crushing it on eBay. Though I did get numerous private offers on a daily basis, many cards would still show up on eBay. Oftentimes I'd reach out to the seller and they would tell me they already knew who I was. This was tremendously helpful as people seemed to want to deal with me before they dealt with anyone else. Positioning yourself like this must be organic. There are several platforms that collectors frequent on the internet to discuss cards, so saturating all of them in a friendly and helpful manner is very beneficial. I realize not everyone has the time or patience for that, but this is what I learned. Be first on the scene. Tip number one for eBay is to be the first one on the scene. This means obsessively checking listings. At any given time of day, I would have a browser tab open with eBay open to a Canseco search results page. This way, I could always quickly hit the eBay tab press F5 and see if anything new popped up in a matter of seconds. I would do this countless times throughout the day. Check misspellings. As I learned with purchasing my first one of one, some people would spell Canseco's name with an O. As I learned with the autographed bat knob card, they could also possibly spell it with two Gs. With my eBay tab open at all times, I wouldn't just merely search Jose Canseco. I would instead use a litany of combined misspellings and formulate it in such a way that eBay would search all of them. Reach out to sellers. If a seller had something rare for sale, regardless if I wanted it or not, I would reach out to them and ask them if they had anything else. You never know what else is hiding in people's closets. I've made several terrific deals with people doing this. Do not ruin other people's deals. It's always a good idea to keep an eye out on the sold listings. It isn't necessarily a bad idea to see if you've missed anything from time to time. You could even reach out to the sellers and see if they have anything else for sale as well. This has worked wonders for me in the past, but I do not suggest trying to work a deal on a card that you've missed out on by offering the seller more money than they agreed to sell someone else for. That's simply bad form and will ruin your name in the hobby. Steer far clear from ruining any deals someone else may have already made. Always be courteous. The longer time went on being the first on the scene, 
the more I realized my competition was paying closer attention to eBay listings as well, and they were also checking eBay significantly more than before. No matter who the seller was, I would always be polite and positive. I'll admit this isn't really a tactic, but rather human decency. My philosophy is always to be kind to others no matter what. You never know what someone else is going through at the time of your interaction with them or how your words will affect them. When competing with other offers, being courteous could be the difference between missing out on a noteworthy card and landing something you want. I would always reach out and let the seller know who I was in an upbeat manner. If the seller had a higher offer from someone else or was planning on selling to someone else, I would always thank them for their time. You never know how your kindness can affect people. And in situations like this, I was often awarded the ability to purchase the card simply because the seller liked our interaction more in spite of someone else offering them a higher price. Even if things didn't work out for that particular card, I would sometimes hear back from the same seller when they had something else I may have been interested in, simply because they didn't like how the buyer of their other item treated them. Don't badmouth your competition. In striking up conversations with many sellers, I was able to form several relationships with them. Because of this, they would tell me what lies or deceit my competition would say about me. It was always the same few guys, and the amount of time and energy they spent badmouthing me behind my back was almost laughable. They were sick and tired of losing out all the time. The good news is that it almost always backfired on them, and I was seen as the more pleasant person to do business with where they appeared very bitter and ugly. The lesson is this. Do not badmouth your competition. Just stay in your lane and be pleasant. Use the eBay app. Actually don't. You don't need to be on your phone any longer than you already are. If, however, for some twisted reason you want to become entrenched in the game of super collecting, the app is necessary. I would always have the app loaded up with the search results for a few Canseco items. So all I'd have to do is refresh the app and see if anything I was interested in was just listed. The app removes any concern of losing out on a card just because you aren't at your computer. Tool number two, online forums. I first became active on the forums when I started collecting as an adult. My favorite and most frequented forums are as follows. Blowout Forum, Freedom Cardboard, Beckett Message Boards, Collector's Universe, Sports Card Forum, and Net54. Just like eBay, I would routinely search for Canseco's name on the forums to see what was available and eventually would search my screen name, Mushi, just in case someone would post a scan and call out my name without actually typing out the name Canseco. Branding and Message Every forum I was on would depict a caricature of myself as well as a familiar signature stating that I was always looking to buy rare Conseco cards. My message was clear and constant and my branding was consistent across all forums. I didn't just want people to know I collected Conseco though. I wanted them to care enough to take the time to tell me about any rare Conseco cards that they would find. That's a tough leap to make for many if you aren't offering anything of value to begin with. What helped me tremendously was that I would spend a lot of time taking my stories and articles I wrote for my blog and self-syndicating them across all of the forums by manually posting them everywhere. This was by far the best and quickest way for me to become recognized. All told, my articles and stories have generated hundreds of thousands of views and many would tell me the only reason they logged in onto the forums was to see if I had written anything new. I didn't just want exposure though. I wanted to provide value and entertainment to those who are reading. Any articles or stories I would write would be to educate or entertain, but with a positive spin. They would never be used to tear anyone down. I think this is why so many people connected with what I was publishing. In spite of me posting a consistently positive message, not everyone would return the favor. Dealing with the trolls. If you're on the forums for any amount of time, it's no secret that you will encounter a troll. 
A troll is someone who will come online to hurl inflammatory messages at an innocent bystander with the intent to cause them emotional harm. You will see this all over the forums and social media. Many will call these people keyboard warriors because they would likely only dare to say negative things because they can hide behind an anonymous username. Do not be misled into thinking that trolls are justified if they say they are okay with quote unquote speaking their mind in person just as they are online. That just means that they're consistently ugly people. The travesty for the troll is that with each nasty thing they post, they are publicly displaying what is truly inside of them. Things that the vast majority of people go to great lengths to hide out of sheer embarrassment. With these unfortunate people, they quote unquote speak their mind in the name of being courageous enough to speak the truth. The truth of the matter is that they aren't courageous at all. They're simply trading human decency for a few pats on the back for being clever or funny. If it blows up in their face or they receive any pushback, they'll typically cry foul and complain that someone doesn't want them stating their opinion. In actuality, it isn't necessarily their opinion that's offensive. It's that they attempted to be hurtful in their delivery. Now that we've defined what a troll is and what their motives are, it's much easier to take the next course of action. Nothing. Try to ignore them. If someone says something to try to get a rise out of you, I know it's easiest to just lash back out, but remember this quote. Never argue with an idiot. They will just drag you down to their level and beat you with experience. It's typically a complete waste of time and energy engaging with them. And there's no reason to give them even a millimeter of your precious brain space. If you must address something, then do it tactfully. Remember that your response is not for them because they aren't worth your time. You're writing for the potentially thousands of others who are reading. In writing something ugly, a troll has already publicly declared that they are a classless loser, not worthy of your time. By responding to them kindly, you're positioning yourself as just the opposite, and people will respect you for that. It may not get more eyeballs on your posts, but that's where you have to make a choice. Do you want to have a questionable name known by many? or a good name known by some. For me, I want a good name. Tool number three, social media. I'll be the first to admit, I was late to the party when it came to social media. This was quite possibly my greatest tool to use for getting cards I did not yet have. Instagram. I use this one least by far. So I will not have a whole lot to say about this, but now and then I would search Instagram for Kinseiko's name just to see what would pop up. From time to time, I would get lucky and find cards I didn't yet have. Unfortunately, I had very little luck getting responses, but Instagram was certainly not a complete waste of time. Checking hashtags of not just your player's last name, but also of his full name and even the latest product he is in can potentially yield results. Admittedly, I probably would have had more success with Instagram had I invested more time into it. Twitter. I was really late to the Twitter game, but in a short amount of time, I amassed over 1,900 followers. This is not a lot compared to many out there, and I'm not too terribly active on it. But whenever I post an article or story, I make sure a link goes on Twitter. The same goes for any YouTube video I post as well. My most successful posts on Twitter were not my articles or videos, though. They were the funny memes I'd post with my website address on them. I would post graphics showing that Donald Trump and Barack Obama were encouraging others to contact me if someone had a rare Canseco card. Another was an animated GIF of Jose Canseco swinging the bat using a series of baseball cards in the style of a flip book. If there was a card I desperately wanted, I would create a wanted graphic with a reward stating that I would pay anyone for information leading to the capture of the card pictured. Successes and failures would be publicized as well. Basically, if there's anything I could do to keep myself in front of everyone's eyes in an entertaining manner, I would do it. And it worked. On many of my memes and gifs I would post, they would be retweeted several times, which meant more eyeballs on my main message. If you have a rare Conseco card, come to me before going anywhere else. 
Facebook. I've been a Facebook user for years, mainly using it to post funny things and keep in touch with friends and family. It wasn't until the past couple years that I learned of quite possibly the most active segment of the hobby community on the internet, Facebook groups. There are countless closed groups out there with thousands of active members who collect baseball cards. These groups have proven themselves to be one of the most effective tools for growing my collection. I quickly found that collectors and pseudo dealers alike would go to Facebook and post their biggest hits to show off to the online community. I remember on a few occasions where I would post something telling people to show their first baseball card related picture that was on their phone. Within an hour, several hundred people posted responses. That goes to show you that a very large number of collectors are active on these groups. I would also stay active by posting articles, stories, videos, GIFs, memes, and wanted graphics. A large number of these collectors were already somewhat familiar with me from the forums. So perhaps the greatest tool in all of social media for me was the tag. A tag is what happens when someone posts your name under a card that's for sale. Facebook will then automatically notify you. This is extremely helpful as Facebook group postings can typically move very quickly. In a matter of minutes, any post could get buried, never to be seen again. Eventually, if someone posted a Canseco card for sale, not only would one person tag me, but several would. The second person to tag me would oftentimes exclaim that they were bummed out that they weren't the first one to do so. Many collectors would tell me that their goal was to find a card for me that I didn't yet have. I realized that not only was a large population of the collecting community looking out for me, they were rooting for me and enjoying watching my collection grow. I can't explain how it happened or why, but I'm extremely grateful that it did. Just like the forums, things can get rowdy on Facebook as well. If you want to be a person who's worthy of others wanting to tell you about cards, then don't be a person who needlessly stirs up negative drama. Don't treat people poorly either. It reflects poorly on you and shows you to be a sour person. Who wants to help out someone like that? Do you want to be remembered as the person who shamelessly ripped apart the poor newbie who was selling his pile of 1990 Donner's Commons for $50? Or do you want people to know you as the type of person who tactfully educates the 1990 Donner seller? When someone tags you, show your gratitude. Far too many times I've seen people tag others and not get any acknowledgement whatsoever. That's like opening the door for someone and them not saying thank you. Always be courteous. Trust me, it helps. I'm not only saying this just for the selfish reason of getting people to like you enough to send leads your way. No, I truly believe that our community, online and offline as a whole, could benefit from simply being kind to one another. Tool number four, the breakers. If you're a baseball card collector nowadays, you know what a breaker is. These guys will purchase cases and cases of material, then sell spots by player or team. For example, if someone purchases a case of 2018 Museum, they may sell the Oakland Athletics spot in the case for $40, the New York Yankees for $150, and so on. When all spots are filled, all teams have buyers, the case will be broken live via video feed. This can be done on various websites, but eventually many of them will end up on YouTube. The owner of the Athletics spot will get all of the Oakland A's cards in the case, the Yankees owner will get all of the Yankees, and so forth. I'm not going to say joining breaks will make you the best super collector you can be. I only joined in two of them myself. I found more success by sitting back and seeing what other people were getting. There were many days that I would sit back at my desk working with a case break playing in the background. That way if I heard Canseco's name, I could quickly take a look to see what was pulled if I wanted to try and make an offer on it before it went to eBay. While it sometimes seemed like trying to find a needle in a haystack, my efforts did pay off a few times. In fact, I remember listening in on countless 2016 Topps Museum breaks. I often wondered why I was doing this as it seemed like a fool's errand. After hours of these breaks were playing in the background, 
I heard the breaker exclaim, Wow, a beautiful one-of-one one bat barrel of Jose Canseco. My heart stopped as I quickly rewound the video to watch what had just happened. Sure enough, there it was. The first one-of-one one Canseco bat barrel to have ever surfaced was staring right back at me from my monitor. Just because I saw it first, though, didn't mean that I would be able to get it. Getting in contact with the buyer of someone in a break can take a lot of time, effort, and finesse. Many times the breaker will be too busy to help facilitate a deal and they may not feel comfortable giving you their customer's contact information. The best way to go about this would be to politely reach out to the breaker with the details of the card, the link to the specific break it was pulled in, the approximate time the card was pulled in the video, and the name of the buyer if you can find that information. The goal is to do anything you can to make it as easy as possible for the breaker to figure out what card you want and who to put you in touch with. This will help your chances of landing the new card tremendously. Still, I found some breakers simply don't want to play ball. Most likely it's because they're too busy and there's nothing in it for them. In this case, you may want to offer them a commission if you want the card badly enough. If they're still unresponsive, you can try hunting the buyer down on your own. Sometimes a break will have the names of the buyers on the side of the screen in the video or will call out their name if they hit something big. Pay attention to these things. Sometimes you can find out who they are by searching the forums or Facebook. Sometimes the breaker will have a channel or a Facebook group where you can ask around as well. Many won't go to these lengths but I've found that it's well worth the effort if you want the card badly enough. I've spent a considerable amount of time tracking down the necessary information to get in touch with owners of cards from the breaks. I found that most breakers are very helpful, but sometimes you just have to put the work in and think outside the box to do what it takes to figure out how to find the buyer directly. Tool number five, the rest of the internet. As collectors, I think we're conditioned to go straight to eBay, social media, or the forums to satisfy our cardboard cravings. The truth of the matter is, there's a whole other world of cards out there that don't even touch the main avenues where cardboard commerce typically takes place. Many collectors out there have blogs showing off what they have picked up, yet hardly anyone knows about them. Do yourself a favor, and if you have an obscure card you're looking for, use the search engines to see if anything comes up. I specifically remember trading away a 2015 Topps Tech card numbered to 25 to make a bigger deal happen. The card had not been available for sale in a long time, so I was a little apprehensive about letting it go. I ended up making the decision to trade it away and found the same card on someone's blog just by Googling it. In four days, I had another copy of the same card back in my collection. Tool number six, my own website. Since I run my own website development company, it only seemed natural for me to build my own website. I started with a free blog and eventually worked my way up to building an entire website where I could write articles, post stories, show videos, and more. While I absolutely loved having a place to call my own where I could do all of this, I decided to begin making the ultimate Jose Canseco website, a place where I could show every single card that I owned and every single card that was on my want list. It took me several months from the time I decided to do this until I finished. I spent a significant amount of time each day scanning, titling, and uploading into my website. I had a good amount of help from former Super Collector Paul and current Super Collector Jamie. Paul had an amazing website showing everything he owned, so once I bought out a large chunk of his collection, I was able to utilize a lot of his scans. Jamie is still super collecting and has an amazing website displaying his incredible collection as well. With his permission, I was able to utilize many of his scans from my want list with the understanding that he would be able to do the same with my scans. Even with the help of their hard work, I still had thousands of items to scan and photograph myself. Eventually, I decided to utilize a phone app named Cam Scanner to take a picture of each card and make them appear to be scans. 
This would allow me to accurately depict the rich rainbow shine of the holographic foil used on many cards. This was very important to me because as time went by, I noticed myself enjoying my collection through my website a hundred times more than I was actually physically pulling out the cards to look at. The world's largest unique Canseco collection would be hiding in boxes just two feet next to me, untouched, but I would typically just use my website if I wanted to look at them. Implementing a powerful search tool feature on my website was important for me for a number of reasons. I love using my website to search a specific card and see the entire run of all versions I had of it. Searching 1987 tops on my website would display all of the different blank backs, wrong backs, reprints, reissues, buybacks, and more. It's so much more difficult to do physically because I would have to dig into my collection and pull them out and look at them all together. I placed my physical collection in alphabetical order by card type, so if I wanted to look at all of my refractors together, it may take 15 minutes to physically pull them from all of the various boxes so that I could look at them together for a minute. When finished, I'd have to spend 15 more minutes filing them away again. The website would allow me to virtually pull all of the cards in 5 seconds, and was especially great for showing all card variations together. I can't quite explain it, but as a collector, I'm sure you understand. There's just something great about looking at the same card in red, yellow, pink, green, purple, orange, and blue, and gold, and black, and... I didn't build the website just so I could merely look at my own collection, though. The main reason I did it was so I could have a searchable visual database of my collection to determine what I had and what I needed at all times. The website allowed me to quickly and easily see what I needed, no matter where I was. If I found a card on eBay that I wasn't sure I had, I no longer had to rely on my memory and risk missing out or buying a double. Instead, I'd quickly pull up my website, do a search, and buy the card if I didn't already have it. In addition to this, I eventually created a searchable database on my website with visual representations of my want list and trade bait as well. The website was instrumental for me to share with others too, so that way they could also search if they had something I did not. I wanted it to be as easy as possible for the entire collecting community to use if they are checking up on cards for me. As time went on, I ended up having over 1,000 Canseco cards more than any other official checklist available because of all of the different types of errors, proofs, and prototypes I'd accumulated. Perhaps one of the coolest things about the website is that it became the standard checklist for Canseco collectors around the world. Countless fellow collectors would write to me thanking me for having it online. They would also say they would spend hours just looking through my collection to document their own and get lost in reading my articles. Many collectors have balked at the idea of having their own website. They've told me that they would worry about their competition seeing what they needed, then plan their bidding accordingly. Let's face it, if you know your biggest competitor needs a card that you need as well, it automatically gives you an edge. I get that completely. I made the choice, however, to expose my collection for all to see. My thinking was this, it's better for the entire world to know what I didn't yet have than to worry about five people out there who may try to cause problems if a card I wanted was posted. Based upon my experience, having your own website can be hugely beneficial in super collecting and can potentially put yourself ahead of the pack. Tool number seven, gain exposure. This hobby has many different avenues that can help you gain exposure and have fun at the same time. Over the past several years, I've been featured on the Topps website and have written various articles for Sports Collectors Daily. I've been interviewed several times by Eric and Paul of Beckett Radio and co-hosted a podcast with Chris Clinton Tamer of Freedom Cardboard. I've written for Houdini on Blowout Cards and even got my own smiley icon on the Blowout Forums website. If you don't know what that is, go to their website forum, create a post, and click the smileys list. You'll see me there. I've done a couple of video interviews with Patrick of Radicards and was also interviewed by Sean and Lou from the Hall of Very Good. 
You can gain a lot of exposure like this too. All you have to do is seek out opportunities and plug in. Using the tools I've described, you can work toward making your name synonymous with your collecting niche and build an army of people looking out for you as well.